Please have a seat. Would you turn to the bottom of page two and our prayer of illumination. Together. O Christ, open our ears and our hearts to receive your word. Speak through your servant today. Amen. So there's a story about uh, a gentleman who's just set up a new, brand new business. Well, he, he'd had another place before, but he moved it to a better, better spot. And one of his friends uh, decided to send him some congratulatory flowers. And so uh, he gets the flowers, the, the florist brings the flowers over, and he thinks, wow, these are beautiful flowers. And he opens the card, and the card says, rest in peace. <laughs> so he's a little upset. Calls the florist. And uh, starts to ream the guy out, and after a bit, the guy says, "Yeah, well, you should look on the bright side. There's somewhere. There's there's some people gathering to remember a, a loved one, and the sign there says, congratulations on your new location." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I figure if John can tell jokes, it's okay. <laughs> Funerals. Funerals. Uh, they're a pretty real part of all our lives. Most of us have been to many. I think uh, I was kind of thinking how many, like probably two, three hundred. Um, we don't look for them, but they come our way. And they actually serve a pretty important purpose. Um, they, they uh, psychologically, socially, culturally, they're pretty much standard across the world. Some, some form of, of get together to. to uh, memorialize or celebrate the life of, of someone who dies. And, you know, it, the, the word that's commonly used in the funeral business and the psycho psych psychology business is closure. And th that's bandied around quite handily, the, the word closure, but there's, there's actually truth to closure. Closure, uh, w when someone dies, it's such a shock, it's hard to believe it's real. And one of the things that, uh, that a service of some kind does or a gathering of some kind does, it's other people come alongside you and, and help you accept the reality of that situation. So, it, which is comforting. It's comforting to have people together, people that care, uh, and, um, you know, it, it helps, you know, you're not delusional. <laughs> you know, this actually is, is real, and then you can start to get on with your life and go through the process of grief. So, it's there. It's, it's, it's healthy psychologically. And uh, uh, if, if we're Christians, of course, we, we, uh, we, we have a, a faith in the world to come, and we have, we have hope in Christ and, and all that, which actually I'm going to talk a bit more about today. So we, we can really celebrate someone's life. And although we, we grieve, we do not do as those who have no hope. So uh, now I say that partly because there is quite a movement afoot these days, in our culture at least, for people not to have anything. You know, they'll just, and that, this happens quite frequently, and you, you probably have picked up on it, that people... At, I think it's usually at the request of the person who has died. So they've left instructions. They don't want to have any fuss made. They don't want to have a service. And people, uh, you know, they, they feel they can't go against the wishes of, of the, 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 their bereaved, uh, their, uh, their loved one. And so they, uh, they don't do it. <coughs> and then a lot of people are left hanging. They feel like there's something missing. There. There's, you know, there's, there's, there's an unfinished business here. So that's not a very healthy thing. Actually, so, so watch that. When you're leaving behind your, uh, your wishes to those who love you, uh, be careful with that because it's not really about you anyway. You know, it's about others. It's, it's something that gives other people a chance to, uh, to, to bring that to, to a close uh, and to deal with their feelings and their grief and so on. So, yeah, so, so let's, let's watch that and discourage that, I think, <laughs> whenever possible. So it's important, I think, to have one. Now, now one of the things I've noticed is, is people have, have, have begun to realize that even if the family or the rest of the family don't feel they can do that, you can still memorialize someone by a gathering in a home or, or whatever. Like, you, you're free to do that, uh, to have a get-together yourself with, with whoever and just tell some stories, say some prayers, whatever it is your thing. So that, and that's what people are doing now. So the family, my brother wouldn't do this, so you know, a bunch of us got together, and we just we sang some songs, we, we told some stories, and you know, they, had, they had some closure that way. So anyway, funerals have been going on for a long, long time. As far as history is 
back, back in history, we go look at the Egyptian pyramids. They're basically funeral, uh, you know, they're, they're two big tombs uh, after big fancy funerals. And, and in our story today, Jesus bumps into a funeral a procession, I guess, as he is coming into town. So he's, uh, last week he was in Capernaum. This week he's, he's gone to a town called uh, Nain, also in Galilee. And he bumps into this uh, funeral procession as it's coming out of town. So presumably they've done whatever they were going to do. Uh, we, I don't really know their, all their uh, rituals and that sort of thing. Um, probably had a period of mourning with lots of lamenting. The Middle Eastern way is lots of wailing. Uh, that's, that's a lot of the way a lot of cultures do that. And then they were carrying out the, the dead boy uh, in the coffin, heading for someplace to bury him. And Jesus comes, bumps in, and probably with Jesus and his entourage of disciples bump into this entourage or small parade of, of mourners as they leave the, the, the town. And uh, what we're told is he was the son of his mother, and she was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. So that's, that's an important little couple of phrases here in the text because it tells us a whole lot of background for who this person was. So this young man who, who has died, he's the only son of his mother who's a widow. Now back in those days, they didn't have CPP, and they didn't have old age pension. They didn't have any kind of pension, right? And uh, women were especially vulnerable. Widows were especially vulnerable. Uh, they have very little protection, and a good chance that at this point in her life, she's going to be on the street begging or something like that. Uh, to, just to, to, to round out her dates. So it's a rough spot for her to be in because she would depend her, on her son. It would befall her to, to her son to take over uh, the care of his mother for the rest of her life. So now she has nobody. So Jesus is compassionate when he, when he sees this situation and he says to her, don't cry. He goes up, he touches the coffin and goes carrying it. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. And it says, the dead man sat up and began to talk. Can you imagine how freaked out you'd be? <laughs> it's interesting how they put that. It's very real, realistic. If he, if he came alive again, he might start to talk. <laughs> it's just like, okay. <laughs> so that's how people knew this is for real. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. It says, they were all filled with awe and praised God. And they said, a great prophet has appeared among us. They said, God has come to help his people. And this news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. So it spread pretty, pretty far and pretty wide. Um, now, one of the things that's of interest here for you biblical scholars is that are these conclusions of the people. They say, a great prophet has appeared among us. Now, they're, they're saying that based on some ancient uh, Jewish history which you may recall. So, so, for instance, very, very famous stories uh, for Jews of Jesus' day and Jews of <laughs> all of us uh, of any era are the stories of, for instance, Elijah and Elisha. They were, they were, uh, Elisha was uh, the successor to Elijah. You probably get your Elishas and your Elijahs mixed up a lot, right? <laughs> so Elijah was first, Elisha came next. Both of them, they're both, there are stories in, uh, about both of those guys raising, or God raising through them, the dead. And in both cases, it was the son of a mother. And in one case, in Elisha's case, it was the son of a widow. <laughs> so, uh, the, these are stories that are just deeply impressed and ingrained in the hearts and the minds of the Jews of Jesus' day. You have to remember that these were their stories. They, they were their culture. It was also their entertainment, if you will. So, they didn't have TV. They didn't have the internet. <laughs> they didn't really have books and novels and stuff. So they were a people of the book. And that's, that is one of the reasons that, that God went about doing things the way he did, was he had, he had prepared a people of the book, a people who knew the stories of his working with humankind. And uh, that was the people to whom Jesus came. So it was all part of God's plan and his wisdom. Uh, so, so these people deeply ingrained in them was this, were these stories of Elijah and Elisha, for instance, and they would know them really well. So, so obviously they, they come to that conclusion. Uh, Elijah was a great prophet. Elisha was a great prophet. Jesus doing the same things. A great prophet has arisen among us. And 
God has come to help his people. Obvious conclusions. And they're right. They're right in both cases. <laughs> now, there is this consistent theme that runs all through the Bible uh, about people being raised from the dead. Now, we, we've mentioned a couple. There, there are more. Even in the Old Testament, there's more. There's one, one a case where uh, some guy's body gets thrown in on some bones of a prophet, where a prophet had been buried, and he comes back to life because he, 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 he was placed on the bones. And then there's a wonderful story of Ezekiel, and the, and the Valley of the Dry Bones. That was a whole, I don't know, it was like, like a destroyed army of some kind. Uh, perhaps thousands of, 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 of people who had died in battle. And actually, if the kids had been here this morning, I was going to take my life in my hand and sing dead bones, dead bones, and dry bones. <laughs> <laughs> now, hear the word of the Lord. The toe bone connected to <laughs> Yeah, I had a whole thing going. Anyway. <laughs> so, so uh, but in that story... Uh, Ezekiel has said that God says, you know, prophesy, son of man, prophesy to these bones. And he prophesies, and the, son, and the bones, there's a, it says there's a great rattle. <laughs> I love the story. And also it says, it says, and he looked about, and there were many bones, and they were very dry. <laughs> very dry bones. And so you can hear this rattle as the, as the skeletons start to form. And then, and then it, the flesh forms, and then the skin forms. And these people start to walk and, and live. And, and so the point is, you know, son of man, I'll do what I want <laughs> with, with, with uh, the dead or the living. Uh, so so it's, it's a prophecy, however you want to take it. It's, it's a story about God's power. Um, for God, death is not that big of a deal. Uh, now, I want to qualify that statement. Because <laughs> on, on the other hand, he, it is a big deal. Yeah. I mean, God, it says, I think one of the Psalms says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So, I mean, he, he, you know, he mourned. Jesus mourns. Uh, we, we have a story uh, about Jesus mourning. Um, and it, 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 there, there are other stories of, of Jesus. So that's, that's from the story of Jesus raising Lazarus, right? So, so the, the, it's, a, it's almost a common theme in the Gospels where Jesus is raising the dead. This is the first instance in his travels. And then actually, in, this is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verse 11, and so on. And about the next chapter... Is the story of uh, Jairus' daughter who dies, and Jesus is on his way, and she dies, and they say, Ah, oh, you don't need to come. And he says, No, I'll come. He comes, raises her. So that's two. And then there's Lazarus, the three. So there's three accounts just in the Gospels of, uh, uh, of Jesus raising people back to life from the dead. Then if you get into the book of Acts, the apostles start doing it. Peter does it in the early on in about chapter eight or nine. There's a story about Peter. Uh, Peter raises this uh, woman called Tabitha, I think it is, or uh, Dorcas. Uh, so, so her name means gazelle, I just remember that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people all loved her, and, and Peter actually raises her from the dead, or God, Jesus raises her through Peter. And there's another instance where Paul, apparently Paul liked to preach. And Paul, he sa it says he, his, his talk lengthened, I forget where he was, somewhere in, uh, uh, somewhere in Asia Minor, I think it was, and it says, Paul stretched out his talk till after midnight. And there was a young fellow sitting in a windowsill. They didn't have windows in the windowsills. <laughs> He's, you know, in this, those climates, there's lots of open buildings. So, and it said, it was like second story up. And the, the boy fell out of the roof, fell asleep, fell out, and was taken up dead. And then it says, Paul, Paul went and prayed for him or stretched himself out on whatever. And he came back to life, and it says Paul went back to preaching again. <laughs> he talked the whole night long. You think I preach a long time? <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing. <laughs> so, so it's almost like, yeah, no big deal. Uh, and there are stories still uh, today, not in our part of the world, but there are stories in the book, I forget what it's called, a, a mega shift or something, about uh, there's a lot of stories and how... how reliable they are uh, of, of people being raised from the dead by um, min ministers and missionaries around the world, uh, that, which has been going on for a long time. I've, I've, heard, I've read many of these stories. Still today, uh, we don't hear about them so much here, but that's interesting. Um, so for God, death is not that big of a deal. He, 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 he's, he's got power beyond that. Now, he, he does love us, and he mourns with us, and he understands our, our pain and our grief. And he doesn't like to, to, you know, one of the strict commandments is thou shalt not kill. It isn't that we should go around willy-nilly killing people because, yeah, it doesn't, no big deal, right? That's not what I mean. 
Uh, so, uh, but to God, he knows it's not final. He sees beyond the grave and is letting us know something about that. He wants us, he wants us to have some, some, some understanding of that. He has our souls in his hands. And he can bring us back to life when he wants to. And he does want to. So it's quite clear, crystal clear actually, if you read many scriptures, that God is planning to resurrect all the dead. Uh, and the resurrection of Jesus, of course, is, is the biggest miracle in the scriptures, and it's the final word of the matter. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says, As in Christ, or as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. So this is, this is God's plan. Uh, back when we get to the, the, uh, the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it tells us quite clearly that Jesus has the keys of death and Hades. He will open and no one shuts. He will shut and no one opens. He has all that power. So uh, now, you may think uh, this is kind of an easter theme I'm running on today, and it is. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, because it, it, really, th there's nothing in Scripture that says only preach about Easter at Easter. In fact, there's nothing in the Scriptures actually that tells us that we should basically celebrate Easter. It just tells us, here's what happened in history. And we have traditionally decided to talk about the resurrection at Easter time. But it's actually a theme for Christians all through the year. Because God is in the business of bringing the dead back to life. And what, what the gospel is about is actually us, we who are dead to God, becoming or being made alive to God in Christ. And, and, and the, the story of the Christian life is one of passing from death to life. Uh, and we don't often think about that. I think we often think about it like it, it's our religion and we have to learn how to be good people. And that's really not what's happening. <laughs> it's really not. I mean, it sort of may seem that way, but it's actually God's power resurrecting us. And Jesus Christ resurrected life, living in us more and more completely. As we die, you may wonder why we go through the processes that we go through and the sufferings that we go through and the trials we go through. But when we go through those things, there's actually something in us that is dying. The old, the, Paul calls the old man. The, the, the power and the strength of sin, the only, thing to, the only way to deal with it is death. And so the scriptures, uh, you know, this is a sermon for another day, but basically... <laughs> The story of the Christian life is one of death and resurrection. Paul says, I die daily. He says, the death of Christ is, is at work in me, so that the life of Christ may be at work in me too. So that it's a bit of a mystery, but it's, it's the way it works. It's the power of God at work in us, not our own efforts and individual you know, attempts to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. It's the power of the cross and of the resurrection. So why is all this so important to, to keep harping on? as we do in, in the Church of Christ. Well, first of all, we're surrounded by the reality of death. And we, we, we will die. You and I will die. And that's a scary thing. It's, the, it's one of the things that causes us the greatest amount of fear. In fact, all our phobias, you can, you can pretty much boil them down to this, right? So people, some people are claustrophobia. They're fear of confined spaces. But what, what are they really afraid of? Now, I think they're afraid, maybe unconsciously, that they'll die if they're in a closed place. place. What about uh, acrophobia? That's what fear of heights. I think you're afraid you're going to fall and die. <laughs> what about agoraphobia? It's like fear of big open spaces. You're afraid that, I don't know, <laughs> the crowd will kill you. <laughs> uh, so, so, but they're real fears and real phobias, but they, they are based kind of somewhere inside us on our fear of death. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what God wants us to, to know and, and to have kind of foundational in our gut is, is a comfort. And, and so that we can relax. We know that he's, even though we die, we shall live. We're, we're to be confident about that. And uh, not only for ourselves, but for those we love and those we care about around us. I'm reading a, a kind of reading. I'm struggling with uh, Richard Dawkins. He's a famous atheist. He's written a book called The God Delusion a few years ago. Boy, it's tough sledding for me. <laughs> He's just like the opposite of whatever. All the things I say, he, he thinks it's, uh, it's totally delusional. Even to believe in the existence of God, is del you are deluded. And uh, so, so, you know, he would argue basically that you, you don't need to get all whippery about dying. It's just as natural, you know, it's like a leaf. The leaf flourishes for a while, then it dies and falls off in the fall, and that's the end of it. That's what you're like. 
So get over it. Tough up. You know, get real. I don't find that that comforting. <laughs> That's the basic gist of it. Um, and, and, but, but for most of the people of the world, that, you know, the, the, if the, the, there's a certain segment that think that's the brutal, honest truth, and we should, you know, if we're if we're smart and intelligent and, and uh, uh, stoic, we, we can face that reality, and not pretend that there's anything going on afterwards, because that's just nonsense. Well, not according to, the, to scripture, not according to Jesus. <laughs> uh, so. Jesus, in fact, Scripture says Jesus came to deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. That there's a bondage to the fear of death that Jesus takes away when he takes that fear away. So that's one. Two, um, I believe that this, this uh, understanding of Christ's power over death and that death is not really a barrier to him, it, it gives us a certain boldness. It gives us a boldness. Uh, the early apostles and the martyrs and the missionaries down through the centuries, that's what they've had, that, that's what's enabled them to go forward and do what they've done. Because they were risking their necks right and left. Martyrs, by definition, got killed for their beliefs. How do you do that? How do you face the possibility in, in, a, in a hostile environment or culture, how do you face that? And uh, how do you go forward and do that when you, there's a good chance you're going to get killed? Or, or, or tortured and killed, you know, or, or whatever. And the reason was they had, a, they, they had such a confidence in the life to come uh, that, they, that they were able to do that. And they were willing to risk their necks. The same thing today. Missionaries, probably this is not taught enough. So we're, we're going to be running short on missionaries because people are afraid to go anywhere lest the plane crashes or they get some horrible disease or they get ambushed by the natives. <laughs> and people do. In our day and age, I've, I've, got, I've heard stories of all those things in this last, within the last century, of people being, being killed for their faith. And people in many countries of the world where it's basically illegal to be a Christian or to speak your faith forth, how do they do it? They do do it. Places like uh, Iran or Pakistan, you know, or uh, all, all kinds of parts of, uh, of Asia and China still. No, China's better. It's better. It's better. But there are parts where it's not so good. And uh, North Korea, <laughs> you really put your neck on the line. So how, how, how can we do that? We have that boldness because we know that though we die, yet shall we live. Uh, just even on our day-to-day -day, uh, ministries and circumstances, to, to pray for the sick, to comfort the bereaved, there's a confidence and a boldness that we have to do those things because of our faith in, in the resurrection and Jesus' victory over death. So I, I like pray for people all the time that are sick, you know, and do I know that God is going to heal them of that sickness? I do not. Sometimes he does. Some Lots of people we pray for get healing in their lives, but they don't always, and they die. But, but that doesn't get to us so much because <laughs> we know that even then God has got them. He's got to, he, he's, he continues to love them and hold them. And when someone dies, we, we have the confidence that, uh, you know, their life, their life goes on. They're okay. They're okay. God's got them in his hand. And lastly, it helps us to answer the big questions. Helps. It's not the final word here, but it helps us to answer the big questions of human tragedy. And those are pretty big, tough questions for us, and, and people challenge us with those things all the time. The tsunami in Japan... Uh, in 2011, just two years ago, um, over 19,000 people died. Just like, you know, in minutes. Um, earthquake in Haiti, 2010, y'all remember that? Now, there's a, there's a big argument about how many died because the numbers have probably been in, inflated to keep help coming. But it, it's at least something like 80,000 up to maybe 310,000 people died in that earthquake. What do you do with that? I mean... How do you believe in a God of love when you know, you're confronted with those realities? Why does God allow those, these kinds of things? And there are lots of things that we could say about that, and I'm not going to get into that really. But at the end of the day, this strikes me. He has their ongoing lives in his hand. And he has great things in store for them, though they have done. That's what I believe. What do you believe? Shall we pray?